Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? Yes. All righty. I'm delighted to welcome you here for our second opening night of the Carmel Bach Festival. My name is David Gordon. I've been with the festival for a long time, and one of the happiest duties I have here is to chat with you before most of our Sunset Center concerts uh, about the music and the musicians and uh, the event that you're going to experience, that we are going to experience tonight. When I say second opening night, you know our, our festival is two weeks long. We have a one week schedule that begins on Saturday and ends on Friday. And the first week ended last night. And so now one of the joys of this festival for us is that we now get to do it all over again. <laughs> and, um, and I don't actually mean that as a joke. Uh, very often uh, those of us, I, I'm a professional singer. We have professional singers and professional instrumentalists up there. Uh, a lot of them, particularly those who are freelance and are traveling, are used to going, arriving in town on Tuesday, having rehearsals Tuesday night, Wednesday, Thursday, perform Friday, Saturday, Sunday matinee, get on a plane Sunday night and fly home. That's life. Life here is that you come and you spend four weeks in a really delightful place with about 150 of your best friends that you've made over the years, and you make music, and then you get to let the piece sit for a week. The Bach Mass in B minor has been sitting for a week, while we do all this other stuff. And now tonight, there will be a brush up. The brush up is going on on stage right now, a little what uh, our conductor calls top and tail, just the beginning and end of certain pieces to make sure that we're still all together with, with the tempo. And, and uh, they'll be balancing that so that when they start at eight o'clock, it will be fresh and new, but also deeper because the entire ensemble has lived together for a week through a whole lot of other repertoire. So when we come back to it, we're, we're different people. <laughs> We have come farther in our relationship with each other and in our relationship with the music on stage. So I'm really looking forward to this and I'm delighted that it's selling so well because this is a really great performance of a really amazing piece. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about why it was written and what it was written for, at least what we think it was written for. I have a couple of housekeeping announcements to make. First, I wanna thank our friends at Access Monterey Peninsula, AMP 27 ampmedia.org. This is a TV broadcasting facility here in the, our community that makes itself available to uh, civic organizations, nonprofits, educational institutions, and the like. And um, it's a wonderful, wonderful um, co-op uh, video uh, TV production studio. It is channel 27 on your TV dial. And this lecture and all of our lectures are live streamed on the internet. So if you cough or applaud right now, you will be heard theoretically around the world. <laughs> and, uh, and then the, the videos are archived on, at ampmedia.org. And uh, actually, they've been playing a few of last year's videos as we led up to the opening night of this year's Bach Festival. Thanks a lot to ampmedia.org. Thanks, Amp27, for being part of this <laughs> festival. I also want to remind you about our latest Carmel tradition. Carmel Bach Festival is filled with traditions, and this is a new one in its fourth year. It is our Art of Music Art Raffle. Our fourth annual art raffle features more than 125 miniature artworks inspired by the natural beauty of Carmel and its vicinity, and by the colorful and exciting atmosphere of the Bach Festival itself. You can view the show and purchase tickets through July 28th. And uh, I don't think any of our red aproned volunteers are here right now, but when you see a festival volunteer wearing a very bright fire engine red apron, they are selling raffle tickets. You also get a free raffle ticket if you have purchased one of our color program books. You place your raffle ticket in the box beneath the work that you would like to win. It worked for me, it can work for you too. The winning tickets will be drawn on July 30 and you do not need to be present to win. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking tonight about an extraordinary piece of work that you may take for granted. And if you do, I want to change that just a little bit. If you want to know more than this little 25 minute lecture, you can visit the website of the Oregon Bach Festival, where I've been part of a consortium that has created a resource center for, music, for information about this work. I actually wrote a one hour essay for them, which is the entry essay to that website. And what I'm giving you tonight is a 25 minute whirlwind tour through that one hour essay. You can hear the lecture and read it online at OregonBachFestival.org. And if you'd like to take me home with you, you can go to the Bach Festival Boutique and buy a, a CD, an audio CD of the lecture. And it's called, and that's what I would like to call what I'm going to say to you now, To Whom 
it may concern. The story of Bach the employee and the greatest job application ever written. Let's get a couple of basic things out of the way right now. Johann Sebastian Bach never composed a mass in B minor. That is, he never created a work with that title. Nor was the composition we call mass in B minor ever performed in his lifetime. It actually could not have been performed in his lifetime. It was written in such a way that there was no place that it could have been performed. The origin of this work is a tangled story. And in order to understand the nature and the character of this artistic masterpiece, it's necessary to know the history of its creation in the 18th century. It also helps to remember, apropos my title, that for his entire adult life from age 17 until he, his death at age 65, Johann Sebastian Bach was an employee. I love to contrast him with Handel, whose music we feature tomorrow. Handel was an impresario. He was a freelancer. He was a self-promoter. He put on shows. He managed theaters. Bach was an employee and was never in his life a freelance musician. He was always working for a salary. That salary was typically, and this was his salary in Leipzig for 27 years, a certain amount of money cash four times a year, a certain amount of um, oats, a certain amount of barley, a certain amount of wheat, a certain amount of excellent firewood floated down the river from North Germany, and a certain number of buckets of beer. <laughs> he was an employee, and that was his salary. It's fascinating for us to examine the story of Bach's professional career and try to understand the decisions that he made at important points in his life. These decisions were inspired by and had a profound influence on his musical creativity. He was born in 1685 in um, Thuringen, which we, call, which we call in English Thuringia. It's a province in Saxony, in central Germany. At the time he was born, there were so many professional musicians in the area named Bach that Bach had become a nickname for any musician of any family name. He was born into the most extraordinary family tree, and for two or three generations before he was born, nearly every male member of the family tree was a professional musician. He was orphaned at a very early age, and he went to live with his older brother, who was, of course, a church musician. And that brother gave him a rudimentary but thorough grounding in harpsichord, music theory, and how to play the violin. In his early teens, the house was becoming a little crowded, and so he got himself into a boarding school about 100 miles north. He walked to school and lived there for several years uh, on a scholarship based on his beautiful soprano voice. And then just before he graduated, he got good grades. He was an excellent student. Just before he graduated, he left. He had no need of a degree. This is a young man who was an orphan and had to support himself, and he knew what his talents were. And he knew that in Arnstadt, there was a new organ being installed in the church. And he thought he had a good chance at getting that job. So he journeyed to Arnstadt and there found that the organ was not completed. And, and there, upon, got a little sidetrack job in the court orchestra in Weimar. At the age of 17, he was a violinist in the court orchestra in Weimar. It often surprises people to know that the first professional musical position that Johann Sebastian Bach had, great organist and so forth, was playing the violin in an orchestra. He was an excellent violinist. Uh, soon the, church, the, the organ in the Arnstadt church was finished, so he left the Weimar Orchestra. He had been a sort of a substitute person in the back chair there. And um, he went back to Arnstadt. It was the custom at that time in such churches to audition a minimum of three before beginning to make any decisions. He auditioned, he was the first person to audition on the new organ and they hired him on the spot. That is the first indication in his career of how good he really was. He worked for a while in Arnstadt and then moved up to a larger town, the town of Mülhausen. He got to Mülhausen just after a huge fire had devastated about two thirds of the town. When it came time to sign his contract, they couldn't find a piece of paper or a quill pen to write with. It was a wonderful church, but a terrible, terrible time in the town of Mülhausen. He was there for only one year. And then in 1708, 
at the, um, at the age of 23, he goes back to Weimar, to the orchestra there. He is, of course, in Weimar working for royalty. When you are, he was a concertmaster there, by the way, and when you are working for royalty in those days, you are actually not employed by them, you were their subject. And so it was, after nine years in Weimar, he asked leave to terminate his contract to take a much more advantageous position in another court orchestra in a town called Kurten. And for having the impudence and temerity to ask for release from his contract, he was put in jail for a month. And only through the intervention of the Prince of Curtin was he released. This is the circumstance under which these people were working. He went to work every day in the livery of a servant. And when he was not making music, he performed household tasks around the palace. The musicians in these court orchestras were servants and they were subject. They were subjects of the prince or the duke. He was in Curtin for six happy years. The prince in Curtin was a music maker himself, and so Bach actually made music with his royal employer. And then the prince married a young woman who had no interest in music at all, and all of a sudden Bach had nothing to do. He wrote not another note and began to look for some place that might be more pleasant to live. Also, his children were growing older and he needed a university to send his sons to, and there was no such school in Curtin. He learned that there was a vacancy in the town of Leipzig. This, the position entailed sort of running the music for the whole city, being in charge of funerals, weddings, and civic events and supervising the music in four different churches, two of which had choirs and orchestras every Sunday. He auditioned for the job, interviewed for the job, and was not in the first round of candidates. And when the first round of candidates for one reason or another dropped out, that's when we have one of the most wonderful quotes from historical records. The town council minutes say, since the best applicants are not available, less satisfactory applicants must be considered, and that's when they opened Johann Sebastian Bach's application. He was accepted. He, he entered into life in Leipzig with high hopes, and it did not work out the way he thought. And it brings us to 1733, when all of this happened that concerns us tonight, when it started. In the year 1733, just to put you in a context, Prince Frederick of Prussia, who was later to be known as, Prince, as Frederick the Great, is 21. Princess Maria Theresa of Vienna is age 16 and has just been crowned the Queen of Bohemia in Prague. Mozart's father, Leopold, is 13 years old. The Trevi Fountain in Rome has just been completed. In 1733, in the far-off colonies of the New World, African slaves till the field, fields. Uh, George Washington has just celebrated his first birthday. James Oglethorpe has just founded the colony of Georgia, named after the British monarch. Benjamin Franklin in 1733 publishes for the first time Poor Richard's Almanac. And in 1733, Father Junipero Serra is just 20 years old. He's completing his studies in his native Majorca and has not yet journeyed to the New World to begin his life's work of establishing missions up and down the Pacific coast. What we refer to, I always like to remind people this, what we refer to as the Baroque, when we're talking about everything that was going on in Europe, is the colonial area on this side of the Atlantic. And then, as now, everything is somehow interconnected and interrelated. And in 1733, in Leipzig, Johann Sebastian Bach is 48. He is at the peak of his artistic powers, and he is increasingly frustrated with his situation in Leipzig. He is unhappy and angry and he believes himself to be the target of political intrigues meant to drive him out. He spent 10 years in Leipzig and for the, for the church services in Leipzig, he has written the St. John Passion, the St. Matthew Passion, at least one or two other passions now lost. The Magnificat, the magnificent Sanctus that we will hear in the mass tonight and nearly 300 cantatas, in addition to his concertos, sonatas, and other chamber music that he wrote in Leipzig. None of it, none of it was published 
in his lifetime. No one had heard any of this music except the congregations in his churches in renditions of it under his own direction. It existed only in manuscripts on his shelves in his music room. And so he's unhappy, he's dissatisfied, he feels himself to be unwelcome in Leipzig, and so he creates one final job application. In the great and princely palace in Dresden in February 13, uh, 1733, Prince Friedrich Augustus II has died. He is the elector of Saxony, the highest ruler in the region in which Bach lives. For residents of Saxony, the elector is for all intents and purposes their king. He was also a renowned patron of the arts, and under his reign, the city of Dresden had become a noble and cultured place. Friedrich Augustus II is automatically succeeded by his only legitimate son. I just love being able to say things like that about royalty in this era. <laughs> it tells you so much, just, just these words. Automatically succeeded by his only legitimate son, the 37-year-old Frederick Augustus III. On July 27th, Bach, with the help of friends and patrons in Dresden, arranges to have a letter sent to Frederick Augustus III, his new prince and elector of Saxony. The letter was part of Bach's attempt to obtain an appointment as court composer in Dresden. I would like to read you my translation of this letter. To his most serene highness, prince and lord, Frederick Augustus, royal prince in, Duke, uh, royal prince in Poland and Lithuania, duke in Saxony, etc., etc. It's a whole paragraph of titles. My most gracious lord, my most serene elector, my most gracious lord. To your royal highness, I submit in deepest devotion the present small work of that science I have achieved in music with the most holy submissive prayer that your highness will look upon it with most gracious eyes, according to your highness's world famous clemency and not according to the poor class of composition. And thus deign to take me under your most mighty protection. For some years and up to the present moment, I've had the directorium of the music in the two principal churches in Leipzig, but have innocently had to suffer one injury or another, and on occasion also a diminution of the fees accruing to me in this office. But these injuries would disappear altogether. If your royal highness would grant me the favor of conferring upon me a title of your highness's court capella, and would let your high command for the issuing of such a document go forth to the proper place. Such a most gracious fulfillment of my most humble prayer will bind me to unending devotion. And I offer myself in most indebted obedience to show at all times upon your Royal Highness's most gracious desire my untiring zeal in the composition of music and to devote my entire forces to the service of your Highness. Remaining in unceasing fidelity, your Royal Highness's most humble and obedient servant, Johann Sebastian Bach. He doesn't use the term that we would use for servant. A diener is a servant who works in the house and lives upstairs in the servants' quarters. He used the term knecht, which is the farmhand who lives in the barn with the animals and is basically a slave. So I could translate this as your royal highness's most humble and obedient slave, and that would be more to the point. And what do we make of this trifling product? <laughs> the trifling product enclosed with this letter was the beautifully prepared music for the Kyrie and the Gloria that we hear tonight as the first two large movements in this mass. But while the Dresden nobility eventually some years later did issue a certificate appointing Bach composer to the royal court capella, et cetera, et cetera, all he got was the piece of paper, a very small annual stipend, and some slight honor. His discontent with working conditions at home in Leipzig continued to grow. The title that he got from Dresden did not turn out to be any help to him at all. And he had no clout, any, he had no further clout with the noble and most wise council of the city of Leipzig, and Leipzig is where he remained until his death 
1750. And what do we make of this trifling product? The Mass is a very large scale work. It's an enormous work. It consists of two flutes, three oboes, two bassoons, horn, three trumpets, timpani, strings, and organ. There are five vocal soloists. The choral parts are considered by all singers whom I know to be harder than the vocal solos. That's not hyperbole. The choir parts in this mass are harder than any of the solos. And the chorus is sometimes divided into eight separate parts. It took the Carmel Bach Festival more than a decade to get it together to perform the entire B minor mass. They started with two movements in the first year in 1935, and then four, and then six, and then finally in 1949 they did 23 movements, and then in the early 1950s they finally got to tw all 24 movements. That's how hard this piece is. The Bach Choir of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, that has had a festival for more than 100 years, was formed in 1900 to sing this work, and it took them two years to get it ready to perform. Based on Bach's milieu as a Lutheran and a Lutheran church musician, the scale and textual content of Bach's Mass in B minor is a total enigma because it was too long to be performed in a church service, and that's where Masses were written to be performed. While the Mass is generally considered to be exclusive part of the Roman Catholic liturgy, it's also very much a part of the, of the Lutheran liturgy, especially the Kyrie and the Gloria, which may be performed in, or could be performed in those days in Lutheran churches in Latin, but not the rest of it. The other movements that Bach created were unusable in the Lutheran church for reasons of length or structure. There's no question of a performance in a Catholic service either because Bach employed certain textual variants in the Credo and in the Gloria that were not admitted in the Roman liturgy. The ordinary mass that was written by, say, Haydn or Mozart to be performed in the liturgy was maybe 25 or 30 minutes long. This works more than two hours long. I believe that the reason Bach wrote this music is to be found in the general direction of the work that he was doing in the last decade of his life. Bach, the famous Lutheran music master, the man who wrote all those churches and who famously took care of all the church music in Leipzig, paid others to do his church work for him beginning at least 10 years before he died. And he never set foot in the churches for the last decade of his life. He was clearly concerned, as he grew older, with creating and compiling musical compositions that contained all his own shining examples of various compositional styles of pieces that he had written. And at the same time, as I said, he had no prospect of hearing these works performed in his lifetime, much less having them published. To cite only the most famous examples of works written in the last 10 years of his life, works that are theoretical and abstract and seem to be his, uh, his way of putting forth the rules and styles and ways that he had of writing music. There is the unfinished art of the fugue, which is an exploration of all possible contrapuntal uses of a single melody, which he began in 1740, put away for a while, and started again in 1747, three years before he died. There is the Klavier Übung, the, the keyboard study, book four, which has been known to us since the 19th century as the Goldberg Variations, which is a compendium of all possible ways of varying a single melody. Again, three years before he died in 1747. Then there is the Musical Offering, also from 1747, an exhaustive exploration of all that could be done with one single musical theme that had been given to him by Frederick the Great of Prussia. There were also various canons, a trio sonata for flute, violin, and continuo with harpsichord obligato, several other highly complex and abstract works, and all of this was going on in the last decade of his life while he was completing and compiling the music we hear tonight. In forging this monumental mass, this two-hour setting of the Latin text, instead of starting fresh, which he easily could have done with his brimming reservoir of creative invention, Bach opted to use almost exclusively pre-existing sources, music that he had already written. Most of the movements in this mass are derived from or based on some vocal solo or choral movement 
that he had already written for use elsewhere in one of his churches. And as we survey these movements in the Mass, and there are different styles, there's very old-fashioned writing, very modern avant-garde writing, very middle-of-the-road traditional Baroque writing, we almost get the sense that Bach was scanning his career to compile his greatest hits by reusing, rewriting, and adapting movements from some of his finest vocal works originally written for very specific occasions on Sundays and very and different words, different text. Bach seems to have been attempting to preserve these disparate favorite movements from other works by gathering them within the more durable context of the Latin mass. Because Bach drew most of the material from existing works, it's a compendium of all the styles that he had employed his whole life, his whole career. And what is astounding is that a work of such splendor, such cohesiveness, such unity and logic could derive from what is essentially a grab bag of earlier stuff. The first complete performance of this work was given in 1859, 109 years after Bach died. Parts of the Mass were first sung and played in America with extremely small forces in an Easter Sunday liturgy at St. Patrick's Church in San, in San Francisco on April 17, 1870. The first complete performance of the Mass in B minor in North America was on March 27, 1900 by the Bach Choir of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It is a fusion, an encyclopedic fusion of every possible Baroque compositional style and form, a synthesis of every stylistic and technical contribution that J.S. Bach made to music, and it embodies the very essence of Baroque art. Beyond its intricacies and it, as an inimitable study of Baroque music, it captures an inspirational quality which defies description in words. Bach may have chosen not to perform his church duties those last 10 years. And when I say he didn't set foot in church, I mean he did not professionally set foot in church. Bach believed that any well-crafted music could glorify God. And it is impossible to believe that he did not intend to glorify God when he was assembling the music we're going to hear tonight. He had a lifetime of serving God through music. He had perhaps finally created the ultimate expression of his faith, the way he knew best, the language of sound. It seems to have been important to him to create these abstract works in his last decade and to make sure that they were not lost. Many of us believe that he bound these pieces together and gave them the sacred text of the Latin Mass because if it said Mass on the cover, people would be less likely to throw it away after he died, which is what happened to nearly half of everything he wrote. Think about that for a minute. Nearly half of everything Bach wrote was totally and irrevocably lost after he died. None of it was published. A few keyboard works were published, to be sure, but none of the vocal music was published. And so he carefully, carefully, carefully bound his beautiful St. Matthew Passion and created this incredible fair copy. And he did the same thing with the Mass in B minor, and he gave them both to his son, Carl Philip Emanuel, because he figured there was the best chance of saving this music, and he was right. Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach let scholars and musicologists and researchers look at this music even in the decades after his father's death. He preserved the manuscript and made possible that performance ultimately, thereby in 1859, 109 years after Bach's death. As he passed his 60th birthday, in 1745 and began his descent into blindness without any hope of prosperity or fame, without any prospect for publication of the hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts on his shelves. He continued to dip his goose quill into pen and ink and write, and when he could no longer see, 
He sat in darkness and told his assistant what to write. And he did this until he was on his deathbed. And we believe now recent scholarship indicates that he was working on this piece last before he died. In that same year, in 1733, when all this started, Bach wrote a celebratory cantata of praise for that new incoming Friedrich Augustus III, the recipient of that letter. And 10 years later, he took that very same music that praised Augustus III, and he changed the words to Hosanna. And we hear it tonight, not once, but twice. That, perhaps, is the point of this so-called job application because God was for Bach, clearly the ultimate king. And perhaps it was that king to whom this job application was ultimately directed. It is said that when the angels entertain other angels, they play the music of Mozart. But when they make music privately among themselves, they play Bach. And we can only hope that Bach received his appointment as Kapellmeister to the Heavenly Ensemble. Thank you very much. <laughs>